Today we are looking at properties of antigens. So let's go from definition first. So an immunogen is a substance that induces a specific immune response. An antigen is a substance that reacts with the products of a specific immune response. A haptans is a substance that is non-immunogenic but can react with products of a specific immune response. Haptans are small molecules which enable induce an immune response when administered by themselves, but which can be coupled to carry a molecule. Free haptans, however, can react with the products of an immune response after such products have been listed. Haptans have the property of antigenicity but not immunogenicity. Our next definition is the epitope or antigenic determinant. This is a portion of the antigen that combines with the products of a specific immune response. And an antibody is a specific protein which produces a response in an immunogen and reacts with an antigen. Factors that influence immunogenicity. So this includes the foreignness, the size, the chemical composition, the physical form, and the degradability. So with regards to the foreignness, the immune system normally discriminates between non self and non self, such as that only foreign molecules are immunogenic. The size is there's not an absolute size that's above it, it will be immunogenic. However, in general, the larger the molecule, the more immunogenic it is likely to be. For chemical composition, the more complex the substance is chemically, the more immunogenic it will be. The antigenic determinants are created by the primary sequence of residues in the polymer and or by the secondary tertiary according to the structure of the molecule. For the physical form, in general, particulate antigens are more immunogenic than soluble ones and denatured antigens are more immunogenic than the native form. For degradability, antigens that are easily phagocytosed are genuinely more immunogenic. This is because most antigens, such as T-dependent antigens, and the development of immune response requires that the antigens be phagocytosed, processed and presented to helper cells and an antigen presenting cell. The biological system also contributes, such as genetic factors, age. So, the ge so with regards to the genetic factors, some substances are immunogenic in one species but not in another. Similarly, substances that are immunogenic in one individual but not in others, such as responders and non-responders, species or individuals may lack or have altered genes that are told for receptors for the antigen or B cells and T cells, so they may not have the appropriate genes needed for the APC to present antigen to the C helper cells. Age can also influence immunogenicity. Usually the very young and very old have a diminished ability to mount an immune response in response to an immunogen. This includes the dose, the root and the adjuvants. So the dose of the administration of immunogen can influence its immunogenicity. There is a dose of antigen above of which the immune response will not be optimal. For the root, the subcutaneous root is better than the intravenous or intradrastic roots. The root of antigen administration can also alter the nature of response. And for adjuvant substances that can enhance the immune response to an immunogen are called adjuvants. The use of adjuvants, however, are often hampered by undesirable side effects such as fever and inflammation. Nature of immunogens, these are proteins, polysaccharides, nucleic acids and lipids. So the vast majority of immunogens are proteins. These may be pure, pure proteins or they may be glycoproteins or lipoproteins. In general, proteins are usually very good immunogens. Polysaccharides, pure polysaccharides and lipopolysaccharides are, are good immunogens. Nucleic acids are usually purely immunogenic, however, they, may, they become immunogenic when single standard or when complex of proteins. Lipids, in general, lipids are non immunogenic, although they can be haptins. T independent antigens, these are antigens which can directly stimulate the B cells to produce antibody without requirement for T cell help in the general polysaccharides or T independent antigens. The responses to these antigens differ from the responses to other antigens. The properties of T independent antigens. There's poly polyclonal activation of B cells and resistance to degradation. So many of these antigens can activate B cell clones which are specific for other antigens, meaning polyclonal activation. T independent antigens can be subdivided into type 1 and type 2 based on their ability to polyclonally activate B cells. Type 1 T independent antigens are polyclonal activators while type 2 are not. So with regards to T independent antigens, these are generally more resistant to degradation and thus they can persist for longer periods of time and continue to stimulate the immune system. Looking at the polymeric structure, these antigens are characterised by the same antigenic determinant repeated many times. Moving on antigens, these are those that do not directly stimulate the production of antibody without the help of T cells. These proteins are T dependent antigens. Structurally, these antigens are characterised by a few copies of many different antigenic determinants. So, let's look at a definition of haptin carrier conjugates. So, haptin carrier conjugates are immunogenic molecules to which haptins have been covalently attached. The immunogenic molecule is called a carrier. The structure of these is that these conjugates are characterised by having native antigenic determinants of the carrier as well as new determinants created by the haptin, haptenic determinants. The actual determinant created by the haptin consists of the haptin and a few of the adjacent residues, although the antibody produced to be a determinant will also react with the free haptin. In such conjugates, the type of carrier determines whether the response will be T-independent or T-dependent. 
So looking at antigenic de determinants, so determinants recognized by B cells. So these are composed, antigenic determinants are recognized by B cells and the antibodies secreted by B cells are created by the primary sequence of residues in the polymer, which is either linear or sequence determinants and or by secondary tertiary or quarterly structure of the molecule, which are confirmationary determinants. So for their size, the antigenic determinants are small and limited to approximately 48 residues. The combining site of antibody will accommodate an antigenic determinant or approximately 48 residues. Although in theory, each 48 residues can constitute a separate antigenic determinant, in practice, the number of antigenic determinants per antigen is much lower than what would be theoretically possible. Usually, the antigenic determinants are limited to those portions of the antigen that are accessible to the antibodies. Determinants recognized by T cells. Antigenic determinants recognized by T cells are created by the primary sequence of amino acids and proteins. T cells do not recognize polysaccharide or immunotrophic acid ant antigens. This is why polysaccharides are generally T independent antigens and proteins are T dependent antigens. The determinants need not be need to be located on the exposed surface of the antigen, since recognition of the determinant by T cells requires that the antigen be proteolytically degraded into smaller peptides. Free peptides are not recognized by T cells, rather, the peptides associated with molecules coded for by the major histocompatibility complex and is the complex of MHC molecules plus peptides recognized by T cells. In general, antigenic determinants are small and limited to approximately 8 to 15 amino acids. Although in theory each 18 to 15 residues can constitute a separate antigenic determinant, in practice the number of antigenic determinants per antigen is much less than what would be theoretically possible. The antigenic determinants are limited to those portions of the antigen that combine to the MHC molecules. This is why there can be differences in responses of different individuals. Let's look at this phenomenon known as the superantigens. When the immune system encounters a conventional T-dependent antigen, only a small fraction of the T-cell population is able to recognise the antigen and become activated. However, there are some antigens which polyclonally activate a large fraction of T-cells, including up to 25%. These antigens are called superantigens. Examples of superantigens include staphylococcal enterotoxins, staphylococcal toxic shot toxin, staphylococcal exfoliating toxins, and streptococcal pyrogenic exotoxins which are involved in food poisoning, toxic shock syndrome, scalded syndrome, and shock, respectively. Although the bacterial superantigens are the best studied, there are superantigens associated with viruses and other microorganisms as well. The diseases associated with exposure to superantigens are in part due to hyperactivation of the immune system and the subsequent release of biologically active cytokines by activated T cells. Finally, let's look at determinants recognized by the innate immune system. Determinants recognized by the components of the innate immune system differ from those recognized by the adaptive. Antibodies in the B and T cell receptors recognize discrete determinants and demonstrate a high degree of specificity, enabling the adaptive immune system to recognize and react to a particular pathogen. In contrast, components of the innate immune system recognize broad molecular patterns found in pathogens but not in the host. Thus, they lack a high degree of specificity seen in the reactive immune system. The broad molecular patterns recognized by the innate immune system have been called PAMPs, known as pathogen-associated molecular patterns, and receptors for PAMPs are called pattern recognition receptors, PRRs. A particular PRR can recognize a molecular pattern that may be present on a number of different pathogens, enabling the receptor to recognize a variety of different pathogens. Here, let's look at examples of pathogen associated molecular pattern receptors. You can see microbial cell wall components, mannose containing carbohydrates, polyanions, <laughs> lipoproteins, double stranded RNA, LPS, lagellin, etc. You can see the relative PRRs, which is complement mannose binding protein TLF3. You can see the biological consequence of the interaction, such as optimization, complement activation, phagocytosis, matrivage activation, interferon production, secretion of inflammatory cytokines, respectively and macrophage activation once again so that's the end of today's video so hope you've enjoyed that today tune in for more